<laughs> Hello. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Peter Bristol. Um, I am part of the industrial design team here at Oculus. And uh, yeah, welcome to Oculus Connect. Hope you guys are having a good time. Um, super exciting show for us, uh, as you can imagine, particularly for the group that's uh, rep or the group that's been working on the uh, touch controllers as we get, you know, really close to shipping. Um, with things like the uh, pre-orders, uh, pricing, uh, everything becoming real, uh, it again is just just super exciting for us. So. A little bit about the Touch project. It's been it's been a really uh, kind of amazing project, uh, just from a uh, opportunity standpoint. I think, in general, um, it's rare to get to work on something uh, both that's uh, integrating really complex and exciting new technology, and in a way that uh, has the has the kind of potential to impact the world in a in a massive way. So, uh, really neat project, uh, and really proud of the the team that's worked on it and um, the outcome. The, the hardware is super, you know, super exciting from a hardware standpoint, but um, today, and actually, it's exciting from sort of like a lot of different angles, and that's, you know, things from like the texture on the thumbstick down to the button feel and the kind of mechanical robustness, the robustness of the tracking. Every, every uh, detail and every discipline kind of has been executed super well, but rather than focus on the technical challenges uh, associated with getting touch uh, to life. We're going to focus on um, the more architectural problems or the usability problems. So the things that make uh, touch touch. Uh, and then uh, after, after looking at some of those things, uh, we've got a, a panel of the touch development team here, kind of with most of the disciplines uh, represented. So uh, we can talk about anything from the presentation itself to some of the challenges and uh, you know exciting things getting that happened along the way so you probably know this but touch is uh, oculus's motion controllers uh, they combine tracking with uh, a unique set of um, inputs that uh, also offer kind of affordances to uh, create and bring here hand pose, uh, hand pose or gestures into virtual reality. They work with the Rift system, and they bring a kind of next level of immersion into the Rift, uh, Rift ecosystem. So since presence has uh, kind of uh, been possible with headsets, and for Oculus that was around the DK2 timeline, um, the kind of next step in uh, VR has been pretty obvious uh, for us, and that's uh, you, you want to do more than look at the, uh, at the virtual worlds. You want to kind of take part in them. And for Oculus, that was more than just kind of the ability to manipulate objects, but the ability to uh, kind of reach out and actually use your hands in them. So very specifically, that set the target for uh, the controller or motion controller effort that is now touch, and that's let's figure out how to bring hands into VR. Um, let's see, last year at uh, E3, we released or uh, had, had a chance for the first time to share uh, some early touch prototypes as well as uh, an experience called Toybox. Uh, probably most of you have, have seen or heard about it, but um, it, it was an exciting moment for us because just a few months earlier, this stuff was coming to life uh, inside of Oculus. So uh, we. We were excited because it, it, got the it gave us the opportunity to kind of um, show, show and prove two new facets of uh, presence, and that's social presence and hand presence. And uh, hand presence being just you forget you're using controllers and you uh, are able to focus on whatever it is you're up to in VR. And then the social side is sort of a little bit more subtle, but uh, the cues that come uh, from motion and the, the kind of a, the a uh, combination of uh, high fidelity tracking in your hands and on your head, just that movement with pretty relatively simple uh, avatars adds up to, and, and then of course the design of, uh, of the experience, which Toybox does something neat. It, it allows you to kind of focus on things other than the direct avatar itself. So you're kind of 
you know, sharing an experience, not sharing a direct, uh, direct face-to-face -face conversation or something. And those combinations of tracking a uh, simple avatar and uh, a well-projected 3D voice and a well-designed uh, experience add up to really feeling like somebody's virtually present next to you. And that's, you know, I think, as lots of people at Oculus have mentioned, really it's, uh, powerful and set a, uh, a vector that is really exciting for VR. So with that, I'm going to show a quick video um, that shows two people using touch controllers and uh, toy box having fun. So, yeah, pretty sweet. There's, there's a lot of really neat things uh, possible with it. Um, so, as I mentioned, like, today I'm going to try and uh, dive into some of the decisions that uh, we made and that make touch uh, touch. So, before, before doing that, uh, a little caveat. Uh, I've broken it into a handful of kind of elements to look at, um, and they feel a bit sequential the way I go through them. So, I wanted to call it that... It really isn't a kind of a sequential uh, process, and in fact, we we're kind of developing our understanding of kind of some of the underlying technologies, the types of hand poses that were going to be necessary uh, and kind of uh, compelling in VR, and then our, our perspective on a lot of the different uh, decisions. So it's more of like a kind of wave front of knowledge moving forward, but it's easier to kind of talk about them as individual pieces. Um, so the first uh, first thing is the uh, combination of the tracking and the handle, and that sets the, sets kind of the macro level gesture of the product or the, the uh, kind of most zoomed out physical architecture. And it's a combination of our constellation tracking system and then uh, ergonomic handle architecture uh, and figuring out the right way to put those together. So a little bit about the constellation tracking system, it's a uh, uses a optical uh, sensor and an array of LEDs. And the, basically, the more LEDs that are visible and the uh, farther they are apart, the more robust the tracking system is. But you can imagine uh, that's sort of directly at odds with making uh, a small, compact kind of product that most designers would want to make. So you, you have this sort of natural tension. And you need to find the right, uh, the right balance between those two to make the most uh, holistic or usable product. Um, so, for example, here, the, this is a quite large you know, tracking ring mock-up, and you can imagine kind of sprinkling LEDs all over that surface, and we could have really robust tracking from a lot of different angles, but then you'd have sort of an unwieldy, un, you know, kind of awkward object to hold. So, we're developing our understanding of, of the track and kind of pushing on it to be as small and uh, concise as we can, and then also like learning about um, occlusion and, and other issues that you'll have when you're you know, moving your hands around holding some tracked object. So th the other side of this problem is uh, looking at the, the handle architecture itself, and we looked at a, a, a range of things, uh, different ways to couple to the body, things that clip on, um, more like things close to gloves, um, as well as uh, handheld uh, handles. So here's a slide showing a, a bunch of uh, kind of different explorations. So you can imagine, again, we're sort of at this point exploring um, kind of what it could be physically, but also uh, in parallel, we're developing actually a bunch of the, the systems that make it work. So that's actually trying out uh, prototypes, pushing the tracking system uh, into its kind of smallest form. And 
this, this is a, a project where there actually was an aha moment, and uh, this is kind of a photo of the first uh, 3D printed model of the direction that we, uh, that we did end up uh, choosing for touch. And it, it, it was actually an aha because there's a kind of, it combined from like almost every perspective, it was, uh, it was compelling, it sort of solved all the problems that we had been looking at. And uh, again, we're sort of aiming at that, but it was this kind of, this one coalesced everything in a really nice way. Um, so first off, you can kind of think about the way the tracking ring is integrated into the handle. And the tracking ring, uh, it, it w was kind of, it pushed on the tracking team and looked challenging, but it, it did look possible to them to do. So that they were willing to take it on, which is <laughs> step one. Um, the, the, next, uh, the next thing it had was this sort of uh, integration uh, with the handle that almost wrapped around the body, and it did a couple of things where it made an almost even uh, weight distribution in f uh, kind of over the middle finger, so it, it actually felt pretty natural and balanced in your hand. You could actually could relax your hand a bit in use. Um, and it also, the way it wrapped around the hand provided this sort of a little bit of security, kind of a sense of a protection or a guard, uh, which is great since you're blindfolded basically in VR. Um, uh, the next thing that it had is a, this sort of uh, gun style handle. And that was really important because we, we looked at a lot of, uh, you know, kind of stick style handles and, you know, all sorts of different architectures. And the gun style handles do allow us to get uh, the opposing or get your index finger motion and your thumb motion uh, to not be directly opposing each other. And this way you don't get accidental activation of the top plate UI or the uh, index finger. So you get kind of, uh, yeah, control of your own intent. It also had a natural uh, line of sight to the top UI plate, which is really nice. Um, a lot of the uh, in tracking integrations that we looked at kind of were, were larger and wrapped around the body or wrapped around the hand in a way that would occlude a visual line of sight to the UI. And, even though you're in uh, VR, it's sort of like, uh, I guess, poor form. It's kind of, uh, it doesn't hit, uh, meet con uh, current consumer uh, kind of expectations if you can't see the actual UI you're using. So that was really nice. So combined those elements uh, and the way they solved the problems would, would have been enough for us to kind of go in that direction regardless. But there's another kind of immeasurable value that this uh, direction had, and it's, that um, the, the kind of truncated form that uh, is relieved for the index finger had a, um, it, you know, while based on pure geometry, it had a really unique shape and it was kind of uh, instantly recognizable when you look at it and that gave us confidence that we were kind of heading in a direction uh, where we were not only making uh, something that solved all the problems but something that uh, had sort of uh, recognizable uh, value and so, you know, hopefully could become both iconic and synonymous with our, uh, with our uh, product brand language. So the next thing you'll, uh, you'll notice when looking at touch uh, might look familiar, and that's a combination of a thumbstick, action buttons, and, a, uh, and an index finger trigger. And if it does look familiar, it's probably because it is. Um, it's, it's quite similar to what you see on uh, most modern game, like uh, Gullwing game controllers. And this wasn't a decision Oculus took lightly, but it, it, it is very important. It was um, a decision that really we felt it while Touch was introducing so much uh, newness with the combination of kind of uh, hand controls and tracking that we wanted uh, both developers and users to have something that was uh, something that was familiar to them and something that they already knew how to use. So, you know, you, you really can't ignore 20 years of, uh, 20 years of development and uh, a bunch of know-how. So, allowed us to, to move forward confidently, uh, you know, and create a great base for an input archetype. So, of course, a super exciting and uh, critical piece of touch is uh, how do you actually bring the hand controls in, into VR? And um, in conjunction with that is sort of what hand poses make sense to bring into VR, what's necessary. Um, and, and we do this through a combination of uh, capacitive touch and uh, analog triggers. I'm gonna show a quick video uh, just showing some of the hand poses that you can do and uh, we'll go from there, maybe.
I kind of wish this one had music now. Cool. So yeah, lots of things you can do. Um, so we have basically capacitive touch or uh, capacitive awareness. So cap uh, sense on all the thumb uh, inputs, and that allows us to know uh, you know intent of your thumb at any given time, no matter what input uh, you're using. Then we have uh, cap touch also on the index finger trigger, which again allows us to understand index finger input, and then. We also can use the uh, analog trigger itself to give kind of analog precision of the uh, index finger. And that, uh, it, you know, when you're not holding a virtual object, if you're holding a virtual object, that gets disabled um, and becomes kind of the either, either shoot or, you know, use the tool kind of thing. The last uh, bit is the middle finger button or um, grip button. And that's an uh, analog trigger that's located on the side of the main handle. And that is pr uh, that's worth kind of digging into a little bit deeper. It was one of the um, most new and unique features of touch and also took a lot of time to get right. So with uh, index finger and thumb spoken for um, and understood, we had three fingers left over. And we also had the, the kind of understand that we need to solve the grab, pick up, let go, set down function. Uh, and we want to do that with analog precision. So we have those three fingers left. And we, uh, you know, some of the early explorations used one finger, two, three, fing three fingers. Um, and some of the three finger ones are actually pretty interesting. We, we actually built them up and tried them in VR. And we, uh, you know, specifically the pressure sense one was, it was really interesting where you got extreme, uh, it was kind of gone if you weren't using it. And then you got this extreme kind of accurate uh, analog precision and very intuitive. But it was actually a bit, a bit too intuitive where when you did, uh, you know, you, you did this analog precision to pick something up or set it down. But when you went to throw an object, you would just throw the controller. So <laughs> no good. Um, the, so the, the single, uh, single finger driven um, analog um, triggers actually were functioning pretty well. And we had some, some, uh, some of the early prototypes. Uh, it, it, it's, it, we were actually concerned we wouldn't have the, uh, the dexterity to control your middle finger um, with that level of accuracy. And the, the early prototypes did show we were able to, and everyone seemed to be able to do it pretty well. So uh, we were able to kind of move forward with that uh, in, in confidence. And once kind of setting that trajectory, we looked at a, at a kind of lot of different things from sort of like uh, com the spring actually something it'd be making a spring that you push against, uh, making an unsprung trigger where you actually just kind of slid it around, and then ultimately the more uh, most intuitive and kind of uh, most known solution is the one we went with, which is a more traditional uh, sprung analog trigger. So getting it right uh, is, was interesting, and, and two things that uh, probably to call out with the the pivot location you can see is sort of. Hopefully that's legible to you guys, but it's um, here. This this arm, uh, the pivot location is way up here at the head of the controller, uh, and of course that's the trigger. So we found we needed to push that pivot location almost directly above the um, middle knuckle of the index finger in order to make the trigger travel match and kind of follow naturally uh, the movement of your middle finger. Uh, and that way, you know, it's swung with your finger, and then once it's uh, embedded in the handle, it's pretty much uh, disappeared. And that Im also, once it's embedded in the handle, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty important that you can sit there for a long time. So that brings up kind of the next challenge of getting this thing right, which is the uh, spring force of the trigger itself. And on one end, uh, you really, you really want to be able to kind of use, uh, and particularly for things like first-person shooters, you want to be able to pick something up and use it almost uh, for the entirety of the experience. Um, so you want a pretty light force. But on the other hand, uh, the, 
if you go too light with these things, it turned out you kind of lose the analog precision and it just kind of jumps out of the way. And it also makes it kind of rattly or cheap feeling product. So uh, ultimately, we did find a balance that feels great, but it took a long time to get something so new right. Um, let's see. So now with, uh, with the input scheme uh, pretty well sorted out and understood, uh, we're still a long ways from having a usable product, uh, or at least usable by all people. You know, people's hands vary a lot. Um, and we realize it's going to be a pretty big challenge. The way our, the early prototypes worked is we were taking the the handle and basically uh, locating the controller by setting it in the palm of your hand and then closing your fingers down on the controller. And it worked really well if you had uh, hands basically the same size as the development team. Uh, <laughs> if, if you had hands that were smaller, you would, you would uh, you know, close your hand and fall shy. If your hands were big, you'd kind of go over and overshoot them. And so n not an extremely usable, usable product at that point. Um, so, Looking at, uh, looking at traditional controllers, uh, they function in a way where you uh, set down your uh, in thumb and index fingers on the affordances, and your hands naturally just fall onto an uh, amorphous shape, uh, and you, you move forward, and some, some of those amorphous shapes being more comfortable than others. Um, you also get this kind of added benefit of sharing the, sharing the burden of the uh, weight of the controller and the ability to kind of shift and move as necessary. You know, with a, with a single-handed controller where the goal is uh, motion, motion control capture, you really, you, you really need to be holding onto it relatively securely and uh, you need to hold onto it in, in one spot. So um, looking at hand data, we found that there's a, um, we, we, needed to, we first needed to find some way to get this, uh, these controllers to fit uh, more than one hand. We really didn't want to offer multiple sizes, it's make, make a nightmare for development. Um, so we, we found that there's a common relationship between the uh, main knuckle or the first knuckle of the index finger and the middle knuckle of the thumb. And uh, regardless of hand size, those, when you kind of close your uh, thumb to your hand, those fall very close to each other, and that relationship is really consistent um, across everybody. So with that, we were able to uh, kind of move the origin of the uh, product up into the head of the device um, and actually just over that middle finger knuckle. So again, that middle finger knuckle uh, division of the uh, touch controller uh, acts as a kind of a fulcrum, uh, roughly splitting the weight of the controller so it's quite balanced. Um, and that allowed us to compress the input cluster, input set, uh, really tightly uh, into one location so that we were kind of minimizing the, uh, the impacts of the variable hand sizes. Um, and with that, we, we were able to kind of get out of this, uh, this original uh, ergonomic problem. So that input set uh, felt good and was actually the base that was uh, shared with the uh, original Proto One. The, the, the input scheme was the um, set that was shared uh, on the Proto Ones or the Half Moon prototypes that were shared with Toybox last year. Um, and really, the, it, was, it was really uh, well received outside, inside. Um, but watching people use, uh, use touch and uh, play in these experiences, uh, it, it turned out that um, a, lot of, a lot of the experiences, was particularly social or simpler ones, and, and uh, you, you really didn't, you didn't need the inputs. And I think that that's the combination of uh, the tracking with hand controls is actually really compelling, and often, oftentimes you're just not going to be using the thumb and action buttons. So. Um, we realized we, we needed a place, to, a stable place to put your hand. Here you can see a, a, a shot of kind of, uh, it's a quick shot of process, but on the left is those original Proto Ones. The middle is sort of a kludgy, handmade, uh, bondoed prototype that proved out a direction, and then on the right, the final touch, proto, or, uh, final touch product. Um, what we did was increase the diameter of the disc uh, we actually, surprisingly, you don't have a lot of uh, you don't have a lot of room to work with uh, here. 
where what's comfortable to use for a long period of time, particularly because the handle position is set, uh, you, you have a pretty small uh, angular window of your thumb movement. And so we really wanted to stay within uh, you know, this, this wedge that was comfortable, comfortable for people. So we were comfortable moving, growing that top plate a little bit, but not a lot. Um, so then we compressed the thumbstick and uh, action buttons over towards the index finger, carving out a little landing spot for the, uh, for the thumb. This created quite a bit of work. If, if, you, if you take a look at touch, there's a pretty unique uh, shift boot uh, over our thumbstick that's unique for a reason. There just wasn't room for the traditional kind of uh, ball mechanism. Um, it also did something pretty interesting it, um, that we, we kind of an unforeseen, uh, or a couple of unforeseen improvements to the product. We, we rotated that top plate down to make the uh, access to the thumb rest better, and that actually uh, improved access for everybody, and that was sort of an accidental win for the product. Um, and the other thing that it kind of accidentally heard, you know, that came, out, came about that was nice uh, because of this change was the uh, action buttons getting closer to the thumbstick for more uh, vigorous gaming or intense, uh, in, intense experiences. It decreased the time between the inputs, so really good for high intensity uh, use. And then uh, also opened up this new spot uh, so you could do fun social gestures. <laughs> um, yeah. So that was the, that was the last uh, major functional architectural addition to Touch. Um, and since then, uh, the team and Oculus has been you know, cranking for um, working on everything from sort of uh, you know, solving the tracking uh, to a place where, where it's really robust and we don't have we drop, you know, any drop poses. It's robust in every way. We have you know, been working on the manufacturability and um, the feel of everything and just getting it ready for mass production. So a ton of work has gone on since then, but that did set the tone for all of the uh, kind of usability features of the product. Um, yeah, and ultimately, uh, it, it really isn't, uh, this is particularly, this is, you know, it's always usability is the goal with products, but more so here than in any place is uh, the test of touch. You know, you don't want to look at it as an object or as a thing. You really, uh, it's, its test is if when you go into virtual reality, you forget you're using touch controllers at all and you're just focused on, uh, you know, whatever experience you're in. <laughs>